Hey, happy Thursday. Uh, we're talking about Northern Renaissance and Renaissance life today. And uh, some of the little differences between the North and the South and everything. Alright. Alright, so the Renaissance is going to spread from Italy to places like Germany and Britain around 1500 or so. And there are a couple different reasons why that happens. Uh, one reason, students. Students, when they leave school and go back home, they don't just forget everything that they learn. They take those ideas back with them. And that's something hopefully you guys are doing as well. And, you know, when you learn something, you don't just forget it as soon as you leave the classroom. Maybe, just maybe, something we talk about in our class is something you bring up with somebody else. So that's kind of what these students are doing. They're learning in southern Italy schools and then they're taking their ideas north to places like Germany, France, Britain, wherever it might be. They're also going to be invading armies from Spain and invading armies from France. Uh, Italy is going to be invaded by both Spain and France throughout the years. The soldiers are exposed to new theories, new ideas, and then much like the students, they take those new ideas home with them and they spread. Um, there's also something called movable type. It becomes cheaper and easier to print, which means that books can be produced and carried away and ideas move quicker and further. And then related to that, cheaper books. If people can buy more books and make more books and then they can sell more books and then those ideas are spread. Alright, some differences between the Northern Renaissance and the Southern Renaissance. In the South, if you remember from Tuesday's video or if you're just watching Tuesday's video for the first time, um, a lot of the people in Italy are independent, wealthy, middle-class people or independent, wealthy, upper-class people, and they want to show off their money. Well, in the north, there are still people that want to show off their money, but they're going to be mostly kings and queens and princes and things like that. The north is going to be more Christian. Uh, it's still going to be painting real-world stuff, but it's still going to have a Christian background to it. So you might see the Virgin Mary in a sports car or something like that. Also, instead of going back and looking at ancient Greek, ancient Roman works, the Northern Renaissance thinkers are going to be looking at early religious works like writings by St. Paul or St. Peter instead of Plato and Aristotle. And uh, there's more of a social background variance in the North. Uh, not everybody is wealthy in the North. And the Northern Renaissance is open to more people, which means it has to be uh, more uh, accessible to the common person. So the writing's not as fancy, it's more of, I don't want to say dumbed down, but it is dumbed down in the North a little bit. A very famous name, probably the most famous thinker of the Northern Renaissance, is this guy named Erasmus. Uh, he's a Dutch philosopher, he's a Christian scholar, he was raised as a Catholic and then he began questioning the Catholic Church, and then he goes back to being a Catholic. And he wanted to blend traditional Christianity with the idea of humanism. So he wanted to explore the human condition, what it meant to be human, but he wanted to put it into a Christian framework, a Christian point of view. So he wanted to mix the patience and the calmness and being open-minded that humanists wanted with the traditional love, faith, and hope of Christianity. And he was extremely tolerant. Uh, he wanted to reform religion. He went back and he edited the New Testament. He recreated the New Testament. And he also believed in education, uh, the same education that people like uh, Abelard and, and um, those guys were doing. Uh, he thought that the early church was pure and simple, and he kind of wanted to go back to the way things were. He thought that the Catholic Church had gotten too complicated, and that's something we'll talk more about next week. Um, and once again, he's probably the most important Renaissance humanist, and that's a painting right there of Mr. Erasmus. Northern Renaissance art is different from the Southern Renaissance art, and here you got two of the most famous artists of the Northern Renaissance. The top right, that is by a guy named Peter Bruegel, and that's called Slaughter of the Innocents, or Massacre of the Innocents. And then at the bottom, you've got 
something by Albert Durer. It's called The Admission of the Trinity. And you can see here, there's still some religious elements in these works. Uh, you still find religious figures, rel religious ideas. A lot of paintings of the Northern Renaissance still show somebody in prayer position with their face turned up and their, their hands in a prayer position. But once again, they might be sitting in a Ferrari while they're praying, or they might be wearing super fancy clothes while they're praying. Um, in cities, there's still Gothic architecture, like we talked about with the cathedrals. And in a lot of places, town halls become mini cathedrals. Northern Renaissance painters are almost exclusively going to use oil paintings. And that's because oil paintings can dry in colder and wetter temperatures. And places like Britain and Germany are very wet. Now, Albert Durer and Peter Bruegel, once again, two most famous artists of the Northern Renaissance, uh, they introduced some things that we take for granted today. Uh, Albrecht Dürer, he comes up with the idea of perspective. Uh, that's where things appear 3D, but they're really not. So if you remember being in high school art class and they were trying to teach you how to draw 3D looking items, that is a creation of, of Albrecht Dürer. Uh, there's also very bright colors that are used. The bottom painting, you can see lots of bright greens, lots of bright reds. And then even in the Bruegel painting at the top, you can see that there are a lot of very uh, bright colors there. Now, Albert Durer, um, that's obviously religious because you can see uh, the Christ on a cross. You can see a depiction of God above him. Uh, you can see some angels in there. But even Peter Bruegel's Massacre of the Innocents or Slaughter of the Innocents is um, supposed to be religious as well. So um, that's kind of what Northern Renaissance art looks like here. Now, what, what was everyday life like? Uh, let's talk about Renaissance marriages. And this is right about the time of the Protestant Reformation. We'll talk about that next class. So. I'm going to break it down into Catholics and Protestants. Uh, Catholics at the time, men marry late because they have to have enough land to support their family. And divorce didn't exist. The only way to get a divorce in a Catholic church was to have a non-consummated marriage. That means that you have not slept together. And of course, that can be very, very hard to prove. So divorce almost never existed. On the other hand, though, marriage was really easy. All it took was a promise. Uh, if you've ever seen one of those bad TV shows where two people say, if we're not married by the age of whatever, then let's get married. Well, the Catholic Church at the time, you were married. It just took a promise. Now, yes, the church preferred you to do your vows in a church and in front of a priest, but they didn't care. If you say, oh, let's get married, you're married. That can also lead to a lot of province uh, problems and a lot of grievances because oh I didn't really mean it I didn't mean to get married I didn't mean to promise you that well how are you going to prove it so misunderstandings uh, somebody wanting to back out of the, the promise somebody misinterpreting what somebody else said that's going to keep the church courts busy for a long time uh, Protestants, on the other hand, they looked at marriage as being a noble estate instead of a requirement. Uh, they thought that it liberated women, or liberated women because, hey, you can be married instead of being a nun. And because Protestants didn't see marriage as being a religious thing, they allowed divorce too because, once again, marriage was not a religious-based thing. Protestants also allowed contraception. Even in the 1500s, Protestants were using contraception. They were using things like penny royal tea or other herbs, other spices. And contraception in the 1500s had about a 70% effective rate, which is a lot higher than, than people realize. 
All right, family size. And before I do family size, here's your word of the day. Today's word of the day is Easter. I hope everybody has a happy Easter and a safe Easter. So your word of the day is Easter. Secret word is Easter. All right, moving on, family size. Uh, women, you're going to have kids a lot more often than you do now. Uh, pregnancy happened much, much more often. On average, you were having a child every 24 to 30 months, and you're probably going to be married around the age of 18. There's about a 10% chance of death from childbirth, and that's about 20 times higher than today. And of course, the more kids you have, the more dangerous it becomes. So it's pretty dangerous to be a woman. Children born in cities are less healthy than children born in the countryside. Uh, that has to do with disease and how easily it will spread. That has to do with uh, pollution conditions. That has to do with um, food conditions as well. And extra daughters were sent to convents to become nuns. So if you're listening right now and you are a sister and you're not the oldest sister, you probably would have become a nun in the Renaissance. Ah, witchcraft. Yes, there was a witchcraft craze. You've probably heard of the Salem witch trials or something like that in American history, but the Salem witch trials actually happened very, very late in the witch craze. It was one of the last great witch hunts in world history, actually. The witch craze actually started way back in the 1400s, and between 1450 and 1625, there are 200,000 people burned for being a witch, and about 85% of them were women. And women were out to get each other. They, women didn't trust each other. Um, it was dangerous to have female friends, and the individualism of women during the Renaissance was based on fear of one another. Women wanted to be independent and alone because if they had female friends, that female friend might accuse you of being a witch. <coughs> Excuse me. Renaissance food. Uh, food, of course, is a basic concern no matter what time period we're in, and food was important during the Renaissance. Most food of the day was preserved over the winter by either salting it or drying it. Things like pickled herring, preserved herring, salted herring were eaten. I've had some pickled and preserved herring before and it's not very good. I don't think I could have lived. But uh, you do get some fresh crops, but they're only available from late spring to early autumn. Uh, of course, you know, food can't grow in the fields during the winter, so that's why it's available only during that time. Beans are cooked with meat. That's a misspelling there. It should say meat, not mean. I'll fix it in a minute. But the beans are cooked with meat to absorb all the salt. So that's why you find a lot of bean dishes that go with meat dishes in European culture. And then there were sauces. They had their version of ketchup and mustard. Uh, there was a yellow sauce that was made of ginger and saffron. Uh, you can still find um, you can still find examples of this out there today. But then they also had a green sauce. The green sauce was made of ginger, uh, cardamom, which are ginger seeds, cloves, green herbs, basil, things like that. You also have pepper. Pepper is used as currency. Uh, pepper was so valuable that people would put that into like marriage dowries. People would use pepper to pay off debts and pepper became one of the main reasons that Europeans are going to explore because pepper is worth that much. Table manners. Um, table manners were, how should we say, bad. People used their fingers to eat. They didn't use forks. Forks were considered dangerous weapons. Uh, even as late as 1897, British sailors on British Navy ships were forbidden to use forks because forks were seen as dangerous weapons. Uh, everybody ate with your hands. There was a big plate of meat in the middle of the table. You pulled the meat off the table and you put it 
in your mouth. If you've ever been to the Renaissance Fest and you've seen people walking around with hunks of, of turkey or big giant turkey legs, that's where that idea comes from. Now you were supposed to wash your hands before you touched the meat. There was supposed to be a little uh, wash basin set up in the corner of the room. You dipped your hands in it and cleaned your hands before you went to eat the meat. But think about it, everybody's hands are dipped in the same water. It's just as dirty as if you didn't wash your hands in the first place. You also have people uh, scratching all over the dinner table because they have lice, they have fleas, and yeah, it's pretty nasty. There are some other changes that you have to know as well. Uh, there are some changes in warfare. Uh, you end up with large armies being created for the first time. Uh, some examples. Spain in the middle of the 1500s had an army of about 40,000. By the time we get to the middle of the 1600s, Sweden has an army of about 175,000. And then by the end of the 1600s, France has an army of about 400,000. So armies are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. You're also going to find gunpowder introduced in large numbers. It was first used by the English at the Battle of Crecy during the Hundred Years' War, and it's going to become a mainstay, a primary weapon of the Renaissance. There is also this idea called the Salvo. Uh, Salvo was created by a guy named Gustavus Adolphus, king of Sweden. Once upon a time, Sweden was the strongest country in the world. Today we think of Sweden with Ikea and putting stuff together, but once upon a time, Sweden was the most powerful country in the world. And their king, Gustavus Adolphus, came up with this idea of firing all his cannons at once. And that is the way warfare is done for the most part today, too. You fire all your guns at once, and it's more powerful. Uh, there's also the idea of conscription. Uh, the armies get so big that they can't support themselves with volunteers, so people are forced to fight, people are forced to join the military, and then these armies are really, really expensive. Uh, these large armies, you have to pay their, t their wages, you have to pay the soldiers year-round, you have to pay for their training, you have to pay for their food, their upkeep. The armies are expensive. Um, sometimes armies were so expensive that people wouldn't fight with them. Um, there's a great example of a guy named Suleiman. That's S-U-L-I-E-M-A-N. Suleiman was from the Ottoman Empire. He tried to attack the city of Vienna, and instead of actually fighting the city of Vienna, he just marched his army in circles to make it look like he had more people than he really did. Why did he do that? Because it would have been too expensive to replace the soldiers. Now we also have this idea of the printing press. And uh, movable type is developed. That's where you could have reusable metal letters instead of just having to carve an entire word or an entire page. You could just use different letters and you could write a sentence, print it, and then take those letters off and then reassemble them in whatever letter you needed. Uh, there's also something called Carolingian minuscule that's developed. In the bottom left, you can see an example of this. Uh, that becomes the standard alphabet, and it was easier to write, easier to print. And it's really not that different than the alphabet we use today. Uh, books are going to become cheaper to produce, ideas spread faster, and page numbers are invented. That way, everybody can talk about what page the latest news is on. All right, so that is today's lecture. A uh, couple of important notes just to remind you. Uh, number one, check the course calendar for whatever work you may have to do this week. If you have already turned in your SLO rough draft, I'm grading those now, we'll get them turned in hopefully this week. If you still have to do your SLO rough draft, make sure you're working on that and you get turned in according to the due date. Also, registration is gonna open up on Monday for summer classes. All summer classes will be online. Uh, we don't know yet when fall registration is going to start, but as soon as we know, I will pass it on to you. All right, have a good Easter. We'll talk to you soon.